from here, let's get into the fun part of it. Yep. Which is in the photos. Sure. Now I'm not going to talk about expensive photos. Yes. I myself don't have fun for it. I'm sure. sure that I have an expert in this case. We talk about robots which are cheap but robust. Robots which have a lot of interface, mm-hmm. which are easier to construct and all that stuff. For the audience, just, just take us through what are the simplest things to think about when you design uh, sure. a robust, cheap robot with a steady motion and activities which makes sense. Yeah. So really, I think the robots that you can build range from a few hundred rupees to a few million dollars. So there's a huge range. And that, in both in terms of the cost and in terms of the fidelity of the machines, as well as the kind of machines that we built. So, for example, in our lab uh, in Edinburgh, so we work with all sorts of robots. We work with fixed-base robots, and these are examples where it's clamped onto a base, doesn't move, and then you've got multi-degrees of freedom arms, um, probably seen it in some of my videos, which they collaborate with. Then the next step is now moving from that fixed base to uh, wheel-based things where the base moves. It's still a relatively simpler control problem because when you kind of leave it, it is stable. It's not a highly unstable dynamical system. Then you have scenarios where you go from wheels to quadrupeds with four legs or six legs. And these are machines that are designed to navigate complex terrain. And then the other end of the spectrum is bipeds or humanoids. Um, so, and those are those tend to be more expensive, more specialized, um, more high-end, high-value stuff. So, so there's a whole range of things. Uh, so, so my sort of thought process, I mean, research is one thing. So I have a huge passion in doing cutting edge research, which pushes the envelope in terms of control, in terms of you know, data driven ways of adapting robotic platforms, sensing. But when it comes to solving real problems, so I think one should not start by looking at a robot and trying to figure out what can I apply it to? It's got to be the other way around. You've got to say there exists an issue, there exists a problem. There exists either an inefficiency or a problem or something and that I am trying to find a solution to that using robotics as one of the nails in your arsenal. So that should be the approach. So often people do it the other way around and that's where people fall in trouble. So in a way, you have to think about what is the value proposition in terms of what you're trying to solve. So I think it very much depends on the industry. So I I have, for example, been interacting. So we have a project with IIT Kanpur and that's, that's part of my visit. Yeah, so we have a project on intelligent warehousing in India and it's very different from the Amazon kind of warehousing situation that uh, where everything is controlled. Here it's a slightly, you've got to look at various parameters like um, you've got to deal with the heat and the dust and the slightly more unreliable resource, uh, sort of components. So we need to have more redundancy built into the system. Labor is relatively cheaper. So I think redundant systems, which may involve more repairs, are okay here. Mm. Uh, so that's the kind of local context that we will need to build into. So we also work with the AI Wadwani Institute in Mumbai. And so they are looking at, instead of looking at technologies, they're looking at the verticals in terms of what are the problems that we need to solve. So for example, they're working with farmers for looking at a crop, um, you know, fertility prediction based on various things like atmospheric you know, pollution, rainfall, various other parameters, doing what we call personalized solutions to agriculture. There are <clears throat> other scenarios where people have been looking at sort of frugal innovation in the context of basic sanitary requirements. So it could be toilets, could be low house, low, low cost housing. So how can we use robots as a way of 3D printing cheap technologies for building houses. One day you can take up a cement and a 3D printer on the back of a truck and in say two days you can print 3D printed low cost housing to replace some some, some of the settlements that are not so hygienic. So those are the kind of sort of solutions which address the, the need and the envelope but also provides technology to deal with that. And one other thing I want to mention is the area of healthcare. So India has, again, a huge diverse population which have got a significant variety of access to resources, whether be it internet, whether be it mobile phones. So getting healthcare to the nooks and corners of India is a big challenge for the government. And there has been some brilliant use of, I mean, I I would call that robotics as well, of of technology that can be added on or fitted on to your mobile phone and you can use it as a lab on chip to kind of use it to take blood samples, oxygenation samples and detect 
early onset of um, problems like diabetes or, or just use a camera and look into your eye. Microsoft in India run that program in Bangalore. Use it to identify the propensity of getting diabetes, which is a big problem uh, in India. So cancer is another issue. So is there, are there ways of using immersive technologies <clears throat> uh, like robots with a screen and some basic diagnostics mm -hmm. to then access expertise sitting somewhere centrally? Mm -hmm. So there may be an expert doctor who will not have either the resources nor the will to travel to the remote places, but he can deliver his expertise through some remote presence. And this could be in waiting rooms in, in, in airports. It could be in... Uh, waiting rooms in, in schools, wherever there is dead time, wherever there's thing, you can have these kind of delivery of services mm -hmm. from a centralized place without the need for physical presence. On that positive note, any message that you have for engineers who are on the verge, to be a science engineers who can, or electrical engineers who are on the verge of doing research versus becoming specialist robotics engineers or AI developers? Mm -hmm. Okay, the one thing I have to say is that I think there is a role for all kinds of people in today's society. Whether they are coders, whether they are you know, designers, whether they are people who come to conceptualize solutions for a whole global system. So it's about finding a niche, not following the crowd in some sense. So you're a good example of that. I think for your person, I, the reason why I found you really interesting when I was talking to you for a brief amount of time is because, I mean, I think you're somebody who broke the norms in terms of what is a traditional career and sort of really follow the passion. So I think that is important. I think that is hugely important because in terms of driving something, it's not enough if you just do something that's 9 to 5. You need to have the passion for doing it. And if you are not suited for a particular kind of thing, you can change. Um, and that, that's, it's no point sort of doing something that you don't care about. I mean, I, I enjoy going to work in my case because I'm, I'm excited about the new kind of things that you do. Of course, you need the support of a huge network of people. So in my current role, I and mean, I do, my amount of actual research I do is actually quite minuscule, but I direct a lot of research with the right team around, with the, my PhD students, my postdocs, and they are the ones who keep me young in my sort of thought process. And I think that's what you need. And so for me, it's about being passionate about what you do. From an engineer's perspective, it's about finding the passion. And, and for the Indian government, I would say it's about helping reduce the red tape on all of these things, giving people the freedom to express themselves and reducing red tape. That will really propel the economy and the research here. Passion and freedom. Absolutely. Thank you for this. It's an honor and it's a privilege to do this. And I'm sure every engineer and every person who wants to become an engineer or wants to become anything will benefit from that. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.